أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد As we have been mentioning in the previous episodes this holy month of Ramadan has dawned upon us and before we know it it shall be leaving us as well Whenever this holy month comes about, we always begin fasting. Some may complain about the difficulties and the pangs of hunger. And then before we know it, we get habituated to it. And before we know it, begin to, we begin to enjoy it. And then, very shortly afterwards, the month begins to go away from us. The month of Barakah, the month of Rahmah, the month of Istighfar. The month in which Allah has invited us to His banquet, in which He doesn't serve us food. Rather, he makes us refrain from it. Instead, he places on his banquet blessings, he places mercy, and he places forgiveness for you and I to take hold of. When this holy month begins to move away from us, we shall begin to wish if only we did that much more within it. If only we spend that much more time contemplating on the Quran, that much more time in seeking istighfar. Because as soon as the month leaves, the same istighfar may not be available. The same mercies may not be available. You and I should remember that as this month goes day on day, we should be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's given us this life. He's given us this ability to be present in this holy month because we're not aware if we shall be alive next year with good health. I'd like to share with you too a hadith regarding the Quran which the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, mentions. The first is a very strange hadith that the Prophet says many of the reciters of the Qur'an are being cursed. So people are actually reciting the Qur'an but the Qur'an is cursing them. How is this possible? How is it possible that this beautiful book of God, the book that God has sent for guidance, we recite it but for some people the book begins to curse them. That on the day of judgment the book will have a claim against them. That by them reading this Qur'an, instead of getting closer to God, they might be getting further away from Him. One such group of people are those people who come to the Qur'an wanting to arrive at the result that they've already made up in their heads. That they already have a conclusion and they're just simply looking for justification in the Qur'an. Another group of people are those who want to come to the Qur'an in order to bring about facade, in order to bring about disunity amongst people, in order to bring about corruption in the land. So they want to pick out certain verses out of its context and begin to use them. But a third group of people, which we may fall into, God forbid, are those people who read the Qur'an, understand the command of God and purposefully don't follow it. Those people are individuals who have been given guidance, very clear-cut guidance, for example, to pray the five daily prayers, for example, to fast, to stay away from backbiting, not to accuse one another. These are straightforward principles that the Qur'an gives us. And if we're aware of these principles and purposefully we don't follow them, then the Qur'an has a claim against us. Then we're not getting closer to God by reading this Qur'an. Rather, by not acting upon it purposefully, we're actually deviating away from the Holy Qur'an. That it's come as clear guidance and we're rejecting it. This is what kufr is. In Arabic, kafara means to cover something. Here, clear guidance has been given to us and we begin to cover it. Hence, the Prophet says there are some people, people from his own ummah, that read the Qur'an, but the Qur'an curses them. A second hadith that I'd like to bring to your attention, again from the Holy Prophet. He says, when you read the Qur'an, the Qur'an prevents you from doing sins. Just like it's mentioned in the Qur'an that those who pray, they stay away from ill and indecency. In the same way, the Prophet says, when you recite the Qur'an, it keeps you away from sin. And then he continues. And he says, and if you're not being kept away from sin, if you're still sinning, then you're not reading the Qur'an. 
Physically, yes, you might be opening the book and reading its verses, but you're not doing a complete reading. You're not truly reading this book. You're simply regurgitating. You're simply making sounds with your mouth. You're not truly understanding what's being said to you. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about justice in the Quran, when he says he's made men and women and people of different communities, of languages in the Quran is given examples of. And if you and I still go out and we're still racist, then clearly we haven't understood anything from the Quran. If Allah commands in the Quran to the Holy Prophet, stand up in the light, even though it be a little, recite for the sake of God, do something, because the night is the time when you and I can journey quicker to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we spend the entirety of our nights throughout our years in a slumber sleep, then clearly we haven't understood anything from the Quran. When the Quran says that lower the wings of humility for your parents, just like Yusuf does for Yaqub when he returns back to Egypt. And if you and I are those individuals who when we speak to our parents, we speak in a stern manner, we look at them with a harsh gaze, then we haven't understood anything from the Quran. Yes, we've read the Quran. Yes, the words might be memorized in our heads, but honestly, we haven't contemplated on its verses. And it was only revealed in order to be a guide for you and I, not simply to be recited. In the previous episode, when we looked at this beautiful chapter and surah and story of Yusuf, we looked at how Yaqub was dealing with Yusuf, how he may have been showing him certain love and giving him certain time that he was not giving to the other children, not because he was unjust, but because Yusuf needed that time, needed that love, needed that protection in order to bring his potential to fruition, which was to become a great prophet. Today, in this episode, I'd like to ask a different question, still with regards to upbringing. What are the rights that the child has over us as parents? Because sometimes this is misunderstood by us as parents. Many a time as parents, we think that going out and working hard Going out and bringing in money is what our children need from us. That buying them materialistic things, giving them a new gift every week, giving them something new every time that we see them, giving them everything that they want, every child with a new phone, every child with a new tablet. Sometimes we think this is what brings about happiness to the child. This is how I'm doing good for the child. This is what God wants from me from the child. In actual fact, if you look at the life of the Prophet, it was very different. The one thing the Prophet did with his children and his grandchildren was not give them materialistic things. This was there, but to a certain level. The one thing the Prophet did with his children is spend time with them. That is a thing that a child wants that many a children are deprived of. Even if when you become of age, even when you yourself become a parent, the one thing you want from your parent is to spend time with you. And when somebody loses their parent, the one, one of the first regrets that they have is if only I spent more time with my parents. If only I called them more often. If only I spoke to them more often. If only whenever they were talking and they were repeating themselves over and over again. If only I didn't roll my eyes. If only I didn't leave the room. If only I stayed with them. You and I have been given a sign in death. It comes before us. There are no terms and conditions to this. It comes to the young as it comes to the old. You and I have to be wary that our time may come soon. So we must prepare for it. One of the things we must do is use our time correctly. And one of the methods in which we can use our time correctly is with our children. Look at the relationship Yaqub had built up with Yusuf. Such that his children were able to come and speak to him about anything. That a child had a dream, he was able to come and tell his father. He knew the father wouldn't ridicule him. He knew the father wasn't going to laugh at him. That the brothers of Yusuf, even after they committed the atrocious act they did, the person they could come and speak to was their father. Even after they had sinned, they could come to their father. Even when Yaqub comes back and comes to Yusuf in Egypt, look at the communication they have. Look at the way they treat one another. Look at the speech amongst them through the ahadith that we have. This is the relationship that you and I need to cultivate. Not that a child should see you and I as parents simply as piggy banks that they take money from us. Rather, we should be role models for the child. That when the child looks at you and I, when he looks at his father, he wants to become like his father. When he looks at the mother, he wants to become like the mother. But our requirement is that our children should never become like us. Our children should become better than us. 
if they become like us, then we've failed. What I have done then is simply give my child what I have. I want to give my child a head start in life so that by the time he's 20 or 30, he has the experience of a man who's 50 or 60. So that by the time he reaches the age of 50 and 60, he has surpassed me greatly. We know that even if we surpass our parents in knowledge, even if we surpass them in information, in surpass them in wealth, we'll never become greater than them in the eyes of Allah. They will have a station that we can never reach. But my desire as a parent must be that I should give my child everything they require to be given a head start in life. We find in a hadith that there are three requirements of a parent, of a father in particular on a child. The first is that he must give the child a good name. A good name, a name which has meaning to it. Many a times we name our children based on cultural things, main, based on names that are prominent in our culture and sometimes they don't have a meaning to them. Sometimes the names that we give our child don't have a good meaning to them, let alone a meaning. We must make sure that when we name our child or our children, we give them the best of names. The best of names are the names of the prophets, of the imma or other names that have good meanings behind them. The second duty of a parent, of a father in particular, is that he should teach the child the Qur'an. This is not the duty of the madrasa. This is not the duty of a Qur'an teacher. It's the duty of the father to sit down, spend time with the child, listen to the child reciting the Qur'an, correct the child in reciting the Qur'an. This brings about a bond with the child. And finally, the third requirement we have is that when the child comes of age, it is the duty of the father to ensure that he facilitates for the marriage of this child. One of the greatest ills in our society today is the objectification of the opposite gender. And one of the easiest manners in which we can safeguard ourselves and our children from such a vice is to ensure that we have a spouse, that we're married. When a child comes of age, how beautiful it is that he turns around to the parent and says, I'm in difficulty, I need help. This is not a child who is immature. This is a child who is greatly mature. That the child has come back to the parent, the source of assistance and help has come to this parent because they've kept the lines of communication open and are telling the parent, help me. I only see you as a source of help for me. Help me. How do I remove myself from this path? How do I safeguard myself so that I don't fall into this vice? It is only through marriage. And this is the requirement that a parent has, especially the father, to facilitate, not to ridicule the child. You know how many a times a child can speak to us, we can ridicule them, we can belittle them, especially when they're young. We speak to them in a belittling fashion, especially in front of others. Do you know how much this harms the psyche of the child? That the child's confidence gets taken away? That the person who loves me the most, they don't speak to me nicely? Look at Yaqub. Take example from Yaqub. Even after he was aware of what the children had done and they come back, he doesn't belittle them. He doesn't throw them away. He doesn't cut them off. He still speaks to them. He leaves the channels open that one day these children might return back to the right path and I shall be there to embrace them. This is the relationship that you and I should have with, have with our children. We learn it from the Prophet. We learn it from the Imam The Prophet says, speak to your children in baby language. Can you imagine the greatest man who walked the earth would go on his force and have, force and have Hassan and Hussein on his back? Speak to them in gibberish? Why? So you can build a bond between you and your child. The one thing we can conclude that Yaqub definitely did with his children is spend time with them such that the communication between parent and child was open. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the blessings of this holy month that He makes the relationship between us and our parents a relationship of friendliness where we have channels of communication open with them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us and inspire us how to bring up our children such that they remain steadfast on the path of the Ahlul Bayt but also that we keep this channel of communication open so that when our child needs help the first person they should turn around to is not their friends because they might be misguided with what information they get from outside but they turn back to us as our parents we're able to assist them and facilitate for them to remain steadfast within the boundaries of the Sharia. In this month, let us pray for one another, let us pray for our children, and let us pray for our own steadfastness on the path of the Ahlul Bayt. 
عليهم السلام وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين نحن 